are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Oh, it's wonderful to see you, Helen. I'm a huge fan of your work, as you know, and uh, I'm thrilled and really honored that you are guesting. You are the guest of my 100th episode. So welcome. Well, c- congratulations on, on reaching 100. <laughs> it's, it's <a> month. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, it does feel like ages ago that I started the show. This was actually around the same time that you started work on the independent panel that we'll return to. Um, So, Helen, you've been a global thought leader. You're a global personality. You've had all of these hugely important positions in New Zealand as prime minister, but also as administrator of the United Nations Development Program. And you are actually all over the place. I'm, I'm so impressed with all your activities. So let me start with a very general question, Helen. How do you understand the concept of development because this is a show called In Pursuit of Development. So what is development for you these days? Well, for me, it's not just about you know modern highways and, and train systems and, and so on. I really buy into the Amartya Sen definition of development, which in essence, you know, the mission is human freedom. And the process of achieving that is expanding human capabilities. So you zero right in on human development, the critical importance of of education, the critical importance of health. Without our health, we're we're nothing. Uh, I also add housing, which I think is rather Mm underemphasized in development. You know, a a, a child, uh, a person of any age in in insanitary, drafty, cold, damp um, housing uh, cannot thrive. So, I think of you know, the basic investments that have to be made to enable people to have that platform to expand their, their capabilities. Now, what has, of course, changed enormously uh, is absolutely having to bring the sustainability element into this because we did make a lot of progress in reducing extreme poverty. Nowhere near there, but a lot of progress. We did make a lot of progress on expanding life expectancy, getting children into school. But as we near these planetary tipping points over the boundaries that nature establishes, we run the risk of very much going backwards. A a UNDP report a decade or more ago uh, talked about this. Um, So much talk now about how can we sustain the gains we've made uh, if we keep exceeding uh, the bounty which nature has has given us. And I think another overlooked concept for a long time was that of resilience, resilience to disasters of all kinds. Mm. Now, you know, in New Zealand, we're used to being resilient around uh, seismic events. Uh, we are increasingly being challenged, even with the resilience we have, to major, by major climatic events. We we're all challenged by the pandemic. So we need in development, and I don't just mean, quote, developing countries, I mean all of us, we are challenged to look at, are we actually able to sustain our gains with what is going on on around us? So I think putting that framing of inclusive human development, sustainable development, resilient development around what we do is so critical. So we have, at least on the global development agenda, we've moved from the Millennium Development Goals to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and we have, what, around seven years to reach them. Things are not looking good. There is a new IPCC report that was just released yesterday, really warning us that there is, if if we just, if business is, you know, as usual, as, as the case is, we're not really going to make much of a difference. There's political inaction. I wondered whether you think some of the concepts that we still deal with in global development, such as sustainable development, do you think they're still relevant or do we need to supplement these constantly with new ideas? So is it, I mean, you were talking about resilience. That's a part of the sustainable development concept as I understand it. And yet I notice, Helen, that <clears throat> 
people seem to be dissatisfied with the SDGs. They think that we're not going to really get there. So it seems to me we are having in the global development agenda parallel discussions, climate change discussions, SDG discussions, financing discussions, global health discussions. You know, I feel like the global development agenda is very fragmented. Is is that also how you see it? it it's terribly uh, fragmented. And, you know, even if we looked at the what people see as the environmental side of it, we get a lot of publicity about what's happening pursuant to the Climate Change Convention and the Paris Agreement. But the Framework Convention on Climate Change was just one of three great conventions that came out of the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. The other two being the Convention on Biodiversity and the Convention to Combat Desertification. Absolutely critical. I mean, we are walking, mm. the experts tell us, towards a world where a million species, more species, will become extinct. Now, as humanity, we've done a you know, really the shocking job of making many species extinct already. But if we don't mend our ways, don't attend to, to habitat, to protection of, of, of wildlife, uh, protection of you know, the unique uh, rivers, the oceans, the, the whatever, you know, we, we really are doomed. Human beings need functioning ecosystems in order to thrive. But we've put our own development before the ecosystems rather than taking an integrated approach. So you know, how to get back to uh, breathing some life into the sustainable development goals, which clearly are struggling, you know, that those core human development targets aren't going to be met, but a lot of others aren't either. And some of the SDG targets and goals simply weren't measurable anyway, which yeah. was always a problem. So there, there is the SDG summit in New York at the high level week uh, this September. And one just hopes that best minds somewhere are applying themselves as to how to breathe life into what is the right agenda, but probably is unnecessarily complicated, if you like. It seems to me, Helen, that there are countries and groups of countries that are pulling in different directions. So you have some of the countries in the global north talking much more about uh, consumption, economic growth, or, or sort of rejuvenating economic growth following the pandemic, creating jobs, taking care of the welfare states. I think this is, this is also some of the discussions you've been having in New Zealand. And then you have emerging countries, you know, the big countries like China and India talking about how, you know, they are trying to undertake this green transition, but they still need a lot of the fossil fuel energy. And thereby, you know, they're thinking about long term um, addressing the, the climate targets in the long term. And then you have some of the, the poorest countries in the world that are simply struggling there's no money there's no financing um a lot of uh, fragile states are experiencing uh, all a host of problems so in this kind of a fragmented world where you have all of these countries pursuing different agendas the role of the united nations seems to be extremely crucial that's the the closest right we have towards some sort of a global institution that has convening power has legitimacy you mentioned the SDG summit in, in September. What is it that you hope the UN can do? I'm just thinking, given that you've been an insider, a senior leader of the UN, how do you now see the UN from the outside? Do you think it is fit for purpose to deliver on some of these extremely ambitious global development agendas? Or is it, as some people say, it's the member countries that have made the UN as... Um, uh, as weak, perhaps, as it is sometimes considered to be? I always say that, you know, that there's many UNs, but if we you simplify don't. it down to two, uh, there's the member states uh, meeting in the General Assembly with uh, you know, the Security Council is clearly an important organ, which is underperforming and has for years. But then there's the UN organisations, and I was privileged to lead one of them for eight years, the UN Development uh, Programme. Uh, now, what I think in the run-up to the, the summit in September, uh, the member states should be doing, is reaching out to the UN development system and saying, we need your fresh thinking and ideas about how we can turn this around. And, and what better place really to start than with the uh, 
the Human Development Report, which comes out of a you know, quasi-autonomous office within within UNDP, and you know, generally has you know, thought-provoking things to say, scanning the horizon, looking ahead, what are, what are the trends, what needs to be done. Uh, so I hope that the preparation for September it isn't just you know, a member state negotiation on a document. It really needs to be preceded uh, by consultations, which involve uh, the major agencies, both within the UN system and, and beyond, and which involve civil society, because uh, times are bleak, and we're, we're heading for outcomes in 2030, which are not impressive. And if we can't turn that around, it, it does discredit international agenda setting. And that would be a bad thing, because if we don't agree on international agendas, what, what do we actually rally around? So I think you know, it is a bit of a watershed in 2023. Now, let's recall that uh, when there was the Millennium Development Goal um, sort of review summit in 2010, mm -hmm. there was also a panic about the state that the MDGs were in. And that prompted UNDP, which at that time was a, was a thought leader in, in this area and led the UN development system, to say, can we have you know, MDG acceleration? And there was a lot of good work to be done with countries who, who were willing partners to say, okay, pick an MDG that you're really worried about and targets in it that you're really worried about. And by you know, bringing all the stakeholders together, let's see whether we can turn this around. And I, I, I remember an example from Ghana, mm -hmm. where Ghana said, right, we're, we're on, we're, we're really worried. Um, about maternal mortality. We're not making the progress. And when the deep dive went into that, government, the UN team, uh, the agencies, civil society, some very practical things came out, which was that the poor didn't get access to the health insurance scheme. <laughs> that, that needed to be paid for. That uh, the poorest woman didn't have transport to facilities. That had to be paid for that the highest rate of mortality was among the very young mothers, the adolescent mothers who, who dropped out of school early and were having children before their bodies were really ready for it. So, you know, there's three areas of focus. Fix the transport access, uh, make the insurance scheme possible uh, for women to get the services they, they need and keep girls in school. You know, you will reduce maternal mortality if you do these things. And, and of course, you know, support for the sexual and reproductive health agenda helps a, a lot as well. So there are practical things you do if, if you're really focused. And I think we need that, that kind of laser-like focus again on the SDGs. So, you know, I was um, in New York and Washington uh, in January of this year, interacting with the bank and a host of UN agencies together with the Norwegian government. We're part of this expert group that the government of Norway has put together to come up with recommendations for financing sustainable development in the years forward. And one of the impressions that I got from these meetings, Helen, is that the bank is not necessarily talking with UN agencies in New York. UN agencies yeah. themselves, they are worried about money or the lack of it coming to their organizations. And there is uh, competition also among many of these agencies. There is this feeling among some that you should actually concentrate. We should have maybe a core group of UN agencies and some of the smaller ones, you know, need to um, perhaps be organized differently. So there's been so much talk about UN reform um, you know, strengthening the 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 role of the uh, the national the the local or the national coordinator, the resident coordinator's office. All of this, where is it you see that the UN should be tightening up? Is there is there scope and willingness to to reform the way going forward? Because a lot of agencies, including the UNDP, they're struggling to get financing. Yes, I think all the, the the core development agencies are struggling for for money, uh, and that that's partly because a we're in hard times post pandemic. Uh, the pandemic wrecked the finances not only of low and middle income countries but of high income countries as well, all of which have taken on more, far more debt 
generally than they're, they're comfortable with. Um, and then, uh, of course, you you have the war in Ukraine, which yeah. is bleeding a number of the traditional donors dry, not not only with the military support that they're giving to Ukraine, but also the humanitarian need. And the humanitarian need when you had, what, six million people go over the borders and probably roughly as many again dislocated within Ukraine. And that came on top of Yemen, you know, Somalia, the crises in the Sahel, uh, you know, the, the, the long list of, of, of conflict-affected and fragile countries, say nothing of Afghanistan, Myanmar. So the money that has been there from the traditional donors, traditional development partners, has been overwhelmingly being skewed uh, into sheer humanitarian relief. And, and we all understand the need to sustain, sustain yeah. life limb. But if that's being done at the same time as countries are cutting their development budget, it, it becomes very, very, very hard. I think um, with the, the UN agencies, look, if, if we had a blank sheet of paper, of course we could you know, design uh, fewer agencies um, with you know, merging of what we now understand mm. to be mandates. But member states have always been a lot better at setting things up than closing them down. That's and true. Every every agency whose neck will be put on a on a chopping block will have champions, right? The, either those in the the capital that they're located in, or or those who um, have a national uh, heading them, or whatever. There's, there'll be a wide wide range of reasons. I think. Um, the smarter thing to do might be to to revisit mandate. I think there are uh, th there is mandate creep, and I think there's also agencies which could uh, probably be n more normative and less operational, uh, because once agencies go operational, then they're all competing in the field for small uh, project funding, and uh, yeah, the issue is the extent to which an agency like UN Women, which is clearly important should simply be be normative and policy focused uh, rather than in the small projects field so that that's i think the sort of lens i would i would take to it now i don't think um the uh, reforms uh, to the resident coordinator system have been particularly effective they're really struggling to fund it now is is my information and that doesn't surprise me because the the you know traditional funders will be saying well excuse me but what is the value. What is the development benefit of this? And it's very hard to show any. Yeah, and this is something that I've discussed with Akim Steiner on the show, actually. And he he says that if only donors understood the value for money that UNDP provides, you know, and we agreed on some form of metric to measure what UNDP mm -hmm. is doing, then you know it would be easier to sell the idea, you know, that in UNDP should should get more money. And I was recently in many of these uh, African countries that I study, and talking to some of the UN organizations, and what they were saying is that they really need core funding, you know, not a trust mm -hmm. fund kind of stuff, not tied to certain projects, just core funding that would basically allow them to do what they need to do with national um, authorities. But let's move mm -hmm. the conversation, Ellen, towards something that um, was created, I think, in July 2020 by the WHO, the independent panel that you co-chaired together mm -hmm. with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And uh, this was, of course, a very timely thing. It came, You came up with this wonderful report called Transforming or Tinkering. Inaction lays the groundwork for another pandemic. Mm -hmm. And when you were here in Oslo last year, presenting some of the findings of that uh, report, I remember one of the key things that we discussed was the role of governance mm -hmm. in, in this whole story, both at the national and also at the global level. So could you please walk us through some of what you found in this independent panel's work what is it that did not work during the pandemic and uh, how prepared are we to mm. to face a, a new one that may be around the corner? Well, no better prepared really, except if we note that this pandemic is so recent and in fact not declared over 
uh, that we might just, you know, in our short term memories, uh, retain some of the learning uh, from it. And there's certainly a lot of learning which was fully uh, you know, documented in the independent panel report. The, this report was called for by the World Health Assembly in May 2020. It wanted a um, comprehensive um, and independent uh, review of the international experience of coordinating the response to the pandemic. And I think when they called for that report in May 2020 and wanted it by the middle of the next year, they thought the pandemic would be done and dusted. <laughs> well, actually, in 2021, it was gathering steam. You know, we can all remember those terrible, shocking scenes from India when the Delta yeah. uh, variant hit India and the, you know, the tragedies of, of people in ambulances outside of the hospitals with the oxygen running out. You know, so so we were present preparing and presenting a report as the pandemic was picking up speed and 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 going to a a scale. Uh, and you know, while the recorded number of deaths, you know, still goes what somewhere in the six to seven million figure, I'm more inclined to follow the Economist Intelligence Unit, which looks at excess mortality, and that takes it to well over twenty million. You know, I mean, this is this is a huge, uh, huge event. The president of the UN General Assembly has described it to me as he sees it as the first major crisis of the Anthropocene era. That's the significance uh, of it. So, you know, there we were preparing a report when the mm -hmm. pandemic was still raging around us. And we, we pointed to numerous things that were wrong. You know, firstly, with respect to the powers of the WHO, which really doesn't have much power. The international health regulations, in our opinion, disempower the WHO rather mm -hmm. than empower it. And we were you know, very struck by what Gro Brunt, Harlem Brundtland, former Norwegian PM and WHO DG, said to us, that if she had had to operate as Director General during the SARS outbreak, under the current international health regulations, she couldn't have done the job she did. Yeah. Well, what does that tell us? That we went backwards with the international legal framework. So we were very clear that WHO under the IHR, international health regulations, has to be empowered to get on the site of an outbreak immediately. We all know that didn't happen. It has to be empowered to publish what it knows, not have to beg a country to release the information as it did with this and previous. Uh, pandemics. It has to be empowered. And, to take and have the money, right? Uh, well, well, the money too is another issue, but, but all mm. of these are, are things which simply need better procedures that member states accept. If WHO says we need visas for the staff to go to the Wuhan market, they've got to be produced. If WHO says we now know enough to tell the world X, government can't stop that. You know, They shouldn't be able to stop it. WHO must be able to act on a precautionary principle. You know, you have a respiratory virus on the move. Uh, you know, th this is dangerous. And it has to be empowered to declare uh, the public health emergency of international concern without being kneecapped by a rather politicised emergency committee. So these are all practical things that could be done mm. with the IHR. Now, the IHR are being reviewed, but, you know, will member states take the steps that need to be taken? What really, you know, concerns me is that after Chernobyl, which was a, a nuclear disaster at mm. scale, member states during the Cold War came together and agreed two new nuclear safety treaties within five months. And here we are, three years after the declaration of the pandemic, you know, three years and a, six weeks after, after the declaration of the public health emergency of international concern, and we have these processes running on the IHR review and the possible new legal instrument, not due to culminate till May 2024, four years with Chernobyl, which yeah. affected a smaller number of people and didn't kill 20 million in five months to get something done. So, you know, the international community really has not stepped up to its responsibility to ensure that there's the proper legal framework for dealing with this. And that, that's just one of many sets of issues, as you know.
Yeah, no, I think those are really important points you raised. The WHO, just the way in which I actually had uh, Grohalem Brundtland on the show. Uh, I've been chatting with her over the last few years. And on the show, she said exactly what you just said, that had she been uh, in charge now, she would not have felt that she was empowered to criticize anybody. But SARS was different. She actually told the Chinese government, you know, um, you need to pull up your socks, give share information, do certain things. So one set of issues then, Helen, has to do with the architecture of how these systems uh, like and, and organizations like the WHO are, are empowered, financed, um, how member countries uh, are willing to listen to some of the advice uh, coming from these organizations. But then there's also this other element that I know a lot of my colleagues in, in particularly on the African continent were really upset with, and that was just the selfishness of the West, you know, this vaccine nationalism, this, um, this, this idea that when push comes to shove, you know, it's us, we think about ourselves and we, 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 all this talk about solidarity disappears and, Solidarity perhaps comes when we end up having a vaccine that we don't really want for ourselves. And then that's the one we'd like to distribute to, to others. I'm not sure how we're going to tackle this idea, you know, this the, the selfishness that we as humans, as countries have inbuilt in us that prevents us, even in such a visible crisis as the pandemic was, to share, mm. you know, what we have and to have some sort of an equitable distribution of resources and vaccines. And, you know, um, any thoughts you have on that? <laughs> oh, yes, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. And if, if I were an African leader or citizen, I, I wouldn't trust you know, exactly. anyone saying, oh, it'll be different next time. I wouldn't trust it. Because what we saw was everyone rushed to save their own skin. Uh, and that left the, you know, the poorest countries just out of the queue. Uh, Gordon Brown, I think, used a phrase that, you know, you're trying to finance a global public good with a charity whip around. You know, <laughs> the, I mean, if, if you had an ideal world, you would have said, OK, there's X amount of vaccine available. That is going to go first around the world to every health worker, to every older person and to every health vulnerable person. And we know that people carrying a burden of non-communicable diseases uh, were, were particularly vulnerable. The, the asthmatics, people with cardiac uh, issues, kidney, uh, diabetes issues, and, and, and so on. So that would have been a rational rollout. That didn't happen. You know, basically in, in the West, we got as much vaccine as we needed. We ordered three times, three to four times as much yeah. as what we needed. We, we gave it to everyone. Well, you know, some countries, frankly, still haven't cleared 10 percent. Well, I wouldn't have any faith that it will be different on any kind of model like that again. So where I've been focusing attention and a, a group of us have had now two comments in, in the Lancet on this uh, is to say that we need uh, an equitable end to end ecosystem, uh, which starts with research and development. Now, one positive thing the WHO has done is designate uh, organizations in South Africa as an mRNA hub. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be restricted to mRNA. It could be other existing technologies. And this hub has something like 14 to 16 spokes in the research and world. Uh, what you need is those institutions to be capacitated to immediately, when a new disease appears on the block, to pivot with the technologies that we have, because mRNA wasn't new, right? This had been in development for a long time. But the, the people who had the technology were able to pivot fast uh, to get those, those vaccines out. So that capacity is needed through the, through the global south, through these kind of hub and spoke arrangements. It needs to be connected in a flow through to manufacturing. And Africa, for example, has an Africa pharmaceutical strategy, but it, it hasn't, for a range of reasons, got a lot of traction on it, partly because they lack a a common regulatory system. Yes. So you could be, for example, producing a whole lot of vaccines in Kenya, which you couldn't sell in, you know, Somalia or, or, or Ghana. Uh, so the number of things that need to be done, but if you could get the R&D capacitated, standing capacity for that, manufacturing capacitated, not just on a standby basis, because there's a need for manufacturing around the regions, you know, week in, week out, year round. 
uh, in any case. And then you come to the issue of how will the products that they they produce in response to the pandemic be financed? And that's mm. where I think uh, the concept that both the independent panel, which I co-chaired, and the G20 high-level panel on sustainable financing for pandemics, we said you needed surge financing uh, up to a uh, hundred billion for that first three months response. And that surge financing could be allocated to making sure that the goods can actually be paid for and got out there uh, in, in the developing country uh, markets. And that needs to be financed by some kind of advanced market commitment, uh, pre-commitment. Ideally, the pandemic fund, which has been established in the yes. World Bank, would be the basis for that. Mm. It hasn't, of course, got enough capital as it is, but if it could go to a sustainable financing model on a basis of everyone pays you know, according to their means and then it's allocated according to need, you could on that basis also have have pre-commitments and be able to leverage response. So all these things are possible with political will and, and leadership. And some of us will continue to bang on about this because we can do better than we have. Well, you have been um, talking to several media outlets. You've been in many high level uh, seminars and discussions. I read actually recently in one of these reports that you said that even though publicly funded science had contributed to the success of these COVID-19 vaccines, they weren't treated as global common goods. And rather, yeah. nationalism and profiteering around vaccines resulted in a catastrophic moral and public health failure, which denied equitable access to all. Where does profits come in here, Helen? There is a dilemma, right? You want to incentivize companies to innovate, and um, but some of this innovation is done by funds from the public, and then the profits perhaps end up um, unfairly in in some quarters, right? So is that one of the reasons why you think a mechanism such as COVAX did not work as well as it was intentioned to? Co COVAX can't work, and we don't need a you know a two point zero model of COVAX and the action for COVID tools accelerator of which it was part. Uh, look, I, I'm, you know, really a skeptic about the pharmaceutical company claims that, uh, you know, they have this massive spending on R&D, which they have to recoup. You know, we all know that a lot of the core science behind the products which have helped us, you know, fight COVID have come from the public Purse, mm. uh, largely from the taxpayers of the of the West, uh, but it was done without conditions, and so you know the companies have ended up with these you know, this vast profiteering of what was uh, to, to to a very significant degree uh, publicly funded uh, uh, inputs, and you know smart governments going forward uh, would say well actually yeah we want this area of science. Uh, we're going to we're going to support this, but we also are going to keep a stake in the IP for a, you know, and, and try to take a global common uh, good approach. It, it's also true that you know, pharmaceutical companies you know tend to spend a lot more on branding and marketing than they ever do on research and development. So the whole thing has been immoral, frankly, and that's why uh, a group of us continue to say that we need to um, you know look to how uh, regions can be empowered to take their own destiny in, into their own hands with R&D, manufacturing, distribution, and, and, and allocation and delivery. And, and there will be a, a need for some surge financing for that in the event of an epidemic. Uh, but the cost of the surge financing is but a drop in the bucket when you compare it to the, the cost of having to you know, go through a global pandemic, which what last estimates were 25 trillion out of the out of the global economy. No, no wonder countries are feeling poor. So, Helen, let's move to the final set of issues. And so we've talked a bit about how there is considerable scientific evidence, knowledge out there, and yet it is not always possible to implement these things. And I wanted us to um, 
discuss a bit towards the end of this conversation on what it was like for you to be a politician, uh, the prime minister of New Zealand. Oh, by the way, I saw that New Zealand is a very happy country, apparently. This World <laughs> Happiness Report says that you're 10th and we are like 7th at the moment. So almost we're, we're almost as happy as Norway. <laughs> you're almost as happy as us. Uh, so how how was it for you to be a member of parliament, the prime minister, leader of the opposition? How did you actually try and uh, succeed or not succeed in trying to convey the science sometimes, the evidence on whatever issue, whether it is health, social protection, and then sell this to the public? And I'm asking you this because I feel that in many ways, in terms of climate, in terms of health, in terms of pandemics, we often have the information. Mm. And we talk about the lack of political will, the lack of political commitment. As, as one of these hugely important leaders at the national and global levels, I'm trying to understand what is it politicians need to do differently, Alan, to translate this research into policy? Well, firstly, they've got to want to translate it. You know, unfortunately, we do have come through our political systems, people who just want to be there for the joyride as long as it, as it interests them. So we need politicians with purpose uh, and politicians prepared to say, I need to see the evidence. You know, look, across our political spectrum, we have different beliefs. Although, you know, in the sort of the societies, the sort of social market societies, if I could call it that way, um, differences between the mainstream parties aren't as aren't as great as they'd often like to pretend, right? Um, you know, there, there's often a, a core of belief, a core of belief that you have to have a basic you know, social welfare system, that you have to have publicly funded education, that the health system's got to be publicly funded, mm. uh, that this is you know, a huge public component to funding your your, your infrastructure, your public transport, what, whatever. So you know, the, the, there's a sort of body of belief that we we buy into. And yes, you'll get you know on the extremes people who want to question all of that, but that's not generally where the where, where the, the, the public is. Now, I think that you know two of the crises we're talking about now, both the COVID pandemic and the climate crisis, have really challenged political leaders because publics are now extremely grumpy. Right? They're, they're mm. grumpy. That they've been subject to restrictions for a number of years. Frankly, without the restrictions uh, during the pandemic, a lot more people would have died. The with the restrictions, we had to play for time until we had vaccines and, and could start to give more uh, protection. And vaccine only doesn't work anyway. You know, really, people should be wearing masks for the long term. I, I recall uh, first going to Japan in 1975. Everyone wore masks yeah. in the streets and on the trains. I thought, what do they know that we don't know? I now know what they knew, that they were living in a very you know, densely populated society and you didn't want to pick up the cold or the flu or whatever from the person next to you on the, on the train. Um, so, you know, in the West, we need to readjust our thinking that if we want to keep ourselves well and protect you know, our elderly and vulnerable, we, we need to start changing the ways that we behave, but that has been challenging. And I saw in the New Zealand experience, you know, Jacinda Ardern and her government did so well in the first year of the pandemic, and then people started getting grumpy, yes. very grumpy. And I suspect that's the same story in many, many uh, uh, countries. Um, and then with the climate crisis, you know, so people kind of get it that, you know, the, the climate is, is, is not what it was. But ask them to do something about it. And that's a different proposition. I remember when I was prime minister, because we ratified the Kyoto Protocol, we, we endeavoured to you know, set targets for uh, carbon, uh, carbon zero. Um, and we set out you know, the range of things that you'd have to do. But when people were surveyed and asked, well, you know, should the government be doing something about climate change? Most people said, yes, the government should be doing something. And then when you got to the question, would you be prepared to pay more for a litre of petrol? Oh, no. <laughs> so, you know, there's a sort of disconnect between what people know, which is that there needs to be action, but they're not prepared to change. So this really, 
you know, requires a lot of patient effort from political leaders to lead people to where to where we need to go. And it's, it's a lot of political will, um, and, and it isn't easy. In New Zealand, uh, all efforts of this kind run up against the um, a, a groundswell in the rural community. Not not everyone, of course, you know, as, as elsewhere. We have enlightened uh, farmers who want to do the right thing, but a lot, you know, question any any action that, that's asked of them. Uh, so it, it, it isn't easy. The, and one does wonder, looking at the overall trends, you know, the, the fact that we've never really got on top of the pandemic, um, the fact that we're trailing so badly on meeting the targets set by the Paris Agreement. Is humanity capable of standing up to and dealing with these existential challenges? You know, or, or do we have, you know, generations of, of citizens and leaders who just want to look the other way and say, oh, well, you know, someone else can bear the cost of that later on. It, it, it is a concern. So we need voices, uh, you know, speaking out for action. And um, I always recall um, uh, Nick Stern, Lord Stern, mm -hmm. who did the report for the British government uh, mm -hmm. on, on climate action. And he made the point, you either pay now or you pay a lot more later. And if we let uh, global warming you know, continue at, at, on the trend it currently is, the adaptation bill will be enormous and we won't be able to stop substantial dislocation of people, loss of life and depletion of, of key resources. So you know, that, that's serious, but translating it into uh, terms that, that can be you know, persuasive politically is the issue. So, you know, one of the things that I notice in Norway and in many other parts of the sort of the global north is this disagreement on intergenerational equity that we have to do something for future generations, which is at the heart of the sustainable development concept, right? It's this idea that I worked hard and, you know, I've paid my taxes. It's my turn to enjoy life. Who are you to tell me to eat less red meat or not fly as much? And so I think some of these, um, issues are things that we are still grappling with. And when politicians come up with this, or they try to operationalize the evidence and talk about uncomfortable issues, there is often that severe backlash, which I think the former prime minister of New Zealand, uh, Jacinda Ardern experienced, and she recently quit. And uh, I think you've also been, um, experiencing something like that. And so what can you say about how easy or how difficult it is for female leaders to to address these uh, these huge issues? Well, I, I think Jacinda Ardern was subjected to a, a you know, an avalanche of misogyny, really. Uh, th there were critics uh, for whom she could never do anything right. You know, when when I was in politics, I was I was attacked as a childless woman who wouldn't know what it was like to bring up a family. Jacinda was attacked for being a young woman who had a child and therefore couldn't possibly have time for the job. So <laughs> you know, they'll attack you one way, one way or the or the other. And I think what also changed a lot from my time in politics is I left New Zealand politics. Well, in early two thousand nine, left the prime minister's job and in um, November, December 2008. Uh, what's changed is the reach of social media. It was in its infancy at, when I left. And now, of course, you know, I mean, how many zillion users does um, Facebook have, Twitter, the other platforms? And while, you know, in many ways, social media can be a force for good, connecting people and ideas, we also know it can be a force for harm with the trolling, the abuse, the the gathering together of people of malign intent to spread uh, disinformation, misinformation, uh, to rally people into, you know, violent uh, protests of some kind or, or another. Uh, so those are pressures that politicians have to bear today. And my understanding is that, you know, the, the academics were doing the research on how this affects women uh, in, in leadership is that it is quite quite disproportionate the level of hate uh, and viciousness that they face.
Helen, it was such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you so much for, for this huge honor. Mm. Thank you, Dan. Ple pleasure to do it and uh, to be on the 100th episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.